Okay, now, as I was uh, pondering what to, to preach on this Sunday, because we really did finish the, the gifts of God. Well, okay, we finished what we were going to talk about as far as the gifts of God were concerned. And it was one of those, you know, if I don't have a series of stuff that I'm doing, then, you know, I don't know what's coming up next. It's really easy when there's a series. It's like, oh, well, this is next because it's next in the series. So uh, I was praying about this and asking God, you know, what is it you want me to talk about? And he brought something up that had occurred to me years ago. Well, occurred to me. That sounds terrible. It's not true. It had occurred to someone else, and they said it. <laughs> and, and so then it struck me really strong. And it was how many times you see the phrase one another in Scripture. You see it a lot. In fact, when I did a word search in the New International for one another, I found over 83 hits, and or I found 83 hits, and over half of those were commandments or commands in Scripture. Now, they're not necessarily like Ten Commandments type things, but it was instruction on how we are supposed to treat each other. Now, in John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus is talking to his disciples on his last day on earth, and he says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. That was Jesus' command to us. Love one another. How is the world supposed to recognize us as believers? By our love. For who? For each other. That's correct. Now let me ask you another question. How is the church known in the world today? Not very loving. We're not usually identified with the way we love each other. And in, over the last maybe five or ten years, I would say we're more known for our picketing than we are for our loving. And yet Jesus very clearly tells us that we will, the world will know that we are disciples by the way we love one another. And that's actually John 13, verse 35. It's following the one I read. God cares a great deal about the way we treat each other. And what I don't, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but in my own life, I've noticed that the way I treat other people is often controlled by how I feel myself. Would you guys agree with that? That sounds pretty accurate. So, like, for example, if, like this morning, I'm in pain, I don't do pain. <laughs> I try to avoid pain as much as I can. I don't like pain. It's very distracting. You can't get things done when you're in pain. Some of you live with chronic pain. And uh, I don't know how you do it because just a little bit of pain over a short period of time. And I'm, that's it! I'm done! And uh, I spent the last several days in serious pain. And uh, uh, so much so that I was, you know, it was one of those, the show must go on was the only thing that got me on stage last night. Uh, was because I knew I had to get out there because everyone else was, you know, relying on me to do my part in the play. And so I went out there and did it. But, and this morning too, same thing. I knew I've got to get up there and give, you know, teach the Word of God because that's what God's called me to do. And that's the only reason I came to church this morning because I knew I had to because I was in pain. And so my, my condition affects the way I treat other people. I was less smiley this morning. I was less, I don't want to say less friendly. I wasn't rude, but I, I wasn't all, you know, excited to see people and how you doing and all that kind of stuff. I was more just kind of in my own little world. Those of you who are there can attest to that. Those of you who weren't, you missed it. It was hilarious, I'm sure. And uh, that's not how it should be. The way I treat other people should be reliant on how much God loves them. In other words, it shouldn't matter because God loves everybody. And so I shouldn't be allowing my own condition to affect the way I treat other people. And yet that's the way we see when we're having a bad day, when we're having a tough time, when we're in physical pain or emotional pain or whatever, we treat other people differently. Now, why does God care so much about the way we treat other people? Well, let me show you something. Matthew chapter 25, I'm not going to read it to you, but Jesus is telling a parable. Oh, Lord, you can raise this if you want the screen. Jesus is telling a parable and he talks about, you know, a king who says, when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. You guys know the one I'm talking about. You know, when I was in prison, you came to visit me and all that kind of stuff. And they said, Ooh, when, when did we ever see you in any of those things? And he said, when you did to the least of these, you did to me. In other words, the way we treat other people does not reflect the way we treat God. The way we treat other people is the way we treat God. How do you love God? 
Well, you put your hands out like this, and you wave them around like you just don't care. No, that's not something else. And you close your eyes, and you sing to the Lord. Yeah, he loves it when you do that. That's great. But that's not biblically how you love the Lord. Biblically, you love the Lord when you love other people. And so it's important how we treat each other because that's how we treat God. <laughs> In fact, the whole idea of loving to worship and treating other people poorly is what the Jews got busted for right before they got kicked out of uh, the promised land. God says, I'm sick and tired of your stinking sacrifices. That's a paraphrase, but the word stinking was in there. I'm tired of your stinking sacrifices. Why don't you love justice? Why don't you desire mercy and compassion? Stop killing animals in my behalf. And that's what we do. We, we kill animals. <laughs> no, that's not right. We worship God, and then we leave the building and we treat each other like crap. That's not how it should be. When we love one another... We love God. Now, I took a look at all of these references, and yeah, I went through them all. It took a while. And I came up with six subcategories of commandments of ways we're supposed to treat one another, how we're supposed to interact with each other, how we're supposed to deal with people, that kind of stuff, okay? I've, I've distilled it down into those six groups and then taken out a bunch of them for time's sake, and we're not even, we're not even going to get through all of them today. We're going to get through as many as we get through, and the next week we'll do as many as we can next week, and so on and so forth until we get finished. So, uh, if you are taking notes, I want you to write down the headings, and you can jot down the references as we go. But uh, as we go through, I want to encourage you <clears throat> to avoid this. Man, I wish so-and-so was here. Avoid that. If that thought pops in your head, shut it down. Take, take, uh, take a, what was it, um... What's that reference? You know, we, we pull down strongholds and we take, take a captive. Take that thought captive in the name of Jesus and say, no, you don't belong in my head. Because what I want you to do is I want you to listen to each of these commands of one another and think, how can I better apply that in my life, even if you're already good at it? In what way would God have me improve in this area? Because this is not for the person sitting next to you or the person that's, you know, uh, at work or the person said to cross the street or whatever. This is for you. Okay? Let them listen to it online and then they can be convicted by God, not by you. All right. Loving one another is the first one. And this one's the ob most obvious. John 13, 34. I already read it. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus gives us a direct command to love. This is also found in places like 1 Peter 1.22, 1 John 3.11, Hebrews 13.1, over and over and over again. Love one another, love one another, love one another. Why is it so important and why is it the most common? Because love is the starting point for everything else. And you'll see this as we go. You know, some of them, uh, uh, the ones we'll do today, be humble with one another, live in harmony with one another, things like that. That has to start with love. So that's why love comes first, and that's why it's the most important commandment, because if you do the others for some other reason, it will sully the response. You need to do it out of love. So love one another. Yay, I love my wife. I love my kids. You know, I love mashed potatoes. Uh, what, what are we talking about here? How does this work? Well, love is very clearly defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, so on and so forth, okay? You can read it on your own. But I want to define love, and I've defined it this way before, as a desire for someone else's benefit over my own. I define love as a desire for someone else's benefit over my own. And the reason I do that is because the word love is translated charity in the King James Version, because it is a selfless giving love. It is not an emotional response or reaction. It is an action towards another person motivated by mercy and compassion and a desire for their benefit. So when I say I love my wife, it's not because when I'm around her I feel better, although a lot of people think that's, well, I love you because when you're near me I get the butterflies. No, I love my wife and I know I love my wife because when she wants to sit and talk and I don't, I usually sit and talk. <laughs> on the first Sunday, she doesn't get, not on a Sunday, she doesn't get anything from me on a Sunday. And so love is desiring another person's benefit over your own. Let me give you an example. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, Paul is instructing the church at Romans, his last part of the letter there, and he's, he's given them his last instructions, and he says, be devoted to one another in love 
and honor one another above yourselves. Be devoted to one another in love. That means that I devote myself to you in love. I say, I'm going to love you. Then you mistreat me. I'm still going to love you. Now, now it's more like this. But you know, I, <laughs> I'm still going to love you. I'm devoted to love you because that's what Scripture says. How do I do that? Honor one another above yourselves. Care about the other person's needs above your own. Put them first. Okay? So let me ask you a question. What does loving one another look like in real life? Short answer examples. Okay, helping them when they're in need. Yeah, filling a need in their life. Good. What else? Yeah, comforting them when their hearts are kind of like um, rejoice with when people rejoice and and, and mourn with them when they when, when they mourn. Right. Yeah. What else? Not giving up, yeah, being devoted, not giving up during the hard times. Very good, yeah. What else? Mm, yeah, being there. That's good. There's lots of different ways. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just curious what, you know, what it, what your initial response is. Because there's lots of different ways to love people. And it's going to look different in different circumstances depending on the person that you're loving. Because everyone receives love differently. And also based on the circumstances of what they need in the moment. Does that make sense? Okay. Kara received a tremendous gift the other day, broke her down crying, <laughs> because it met a, a deep need in her heart that just really touched her. And she just felt so loved, she started crying. I think it made the give her feel a little bad. <laughs> but, but no, no, it didn't make her feel bad. But that's loving someone you know, putting yourself in their shoes, looking at it from their perspective, seeing it from their eyes, and then responding the way that they need you to respond. Now let me ask another question. And the opposite doesn't count. What does not loving someone look like? Yeah, no, no, Tim. To the contrary means the same thing. <laughs> Smart out. <clears throat> Disregarding their feelings? Good, good. Like, doesn't matter how you feel? Yeah, I like that. What else? Couldn't care less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, talking about them behind their back. Yeah. Now, see, that's the opposite of what you said. You can't... <laughs> Not being there, that's good. No, he, he's right. He's right. <laughs> I just got to pick on you. <clears throat> Unforgiveness, yeah, yeah. Unforgiveness is fascinating because... If you're holding on to unforgiveness, you very clearly do not put their needs before your own. I mean, that's, that is the epitome of unlove. Because if love desires their benefit above your own, then when you want them to pay for what they've done, you care more about your benefit than theirs. Even though really no one benefits when you're unforgiving. Okay. So that's good examples of love, okay? How to love, how not to love. And that's what we're supposed to do one with each other. Okay, we're supposed to love one another. Now that's the first one. The second one is to be humble. Be humble with one another. This comes from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. All of you clothe yourselves with humility or put on humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor or grace to the humble. Put on humility. There's been a lot of confusion about what humility means. And people have misunderstood the idea of humility because it doesn't fit well with the Greek. So like the Greek has this word for humility, and then English, the word humility doesn't work well with it because it's bigger than the, than the, uh, than the English word, the Greek word for humility. Uh, meekness is another way to define it, and the, I, my favorite way of defining humility is thinking of others first, okay? Loving them is putting their benefit first, being humble is thinking of others first. And the reason I define it that way is because there's this sneaky thing that people will do where they will think very lowly of themselves and have low self-esteem and think that makes them humble. Unfortunately, they're still thinking about themselves. They're still being selfish and self-centered. They just think they're not good. Does that make sense? So one of the reasons why I was able to tout self-esteem as a teacher, even though some took it to an extreme, was because I understood that if you have low self-esteem, it's still about you. 
So what I, what I wrote an article one time uh, called God Esteem, and that's what we really need to have. We get our value from God, not from ourselves. But being humble is thinking of others first, okay? Now, let me give you an example of humility, which I did not write down. Hmm, I don't have that verse here. Okay, well, let me just <laughs> give you a summary. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Put on the same attitude of Christ, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider, you know, did not consider his godliness or something, something to be grasped. I can't remember the noun there, but anyway, did not consider it something to be grasped. He put on the very nature of a servant, even though he was God. That is humility. And Paul tells us in Philippians to be like Christ, be like Jesus, who was king over everything and still is and came down and served humanity. And you want to talk about a servant. This guy served. I mean, people came up to him that were smelly and dirty and diseased. And he didn't go, oh, yeah, disciples, anyway, take care of this guy. He stinks. No, he laid hands on him. And we had been doing it all day and people showed up and he was tired and he needed to go pray and he needed to prep for tomorrow. He had compassion on them, and he served them, and he prayed for them. Put on that attitude, because guess what? You are a child of the king, but you need to not consider that something to be grasped and say, I'm a child of the king. I don't have to put up with this. I mean, unless it's the devil you're talking about. I don't have to deal with you and your stuff and your issues because I'm a child of the king. Well, that's true, but how did you get adopted into that family? Through Jesus who didn't treat his kingship that way. Instead, he was humble. Let me give you a couple examples from Scripture so you can see what this looks like. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So part of being humble is serving, making yourself a servant, taking care of other people. I always appreciate people in the uh, medical industry, which we have several here tonight, uh, because they, they're constantly serving. Uh, and it's, it, it blows my mind. I've watched him, you know, work with the residents at long-term care and he just serves them, you know? Now he also picks on them a lot, <laughs> but you know, but, it, and he, and he makes sure that they get what they need and you know, he knows that he's in charge, but he also is a servant. I watch him do it and it impresses me. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, they're in charge. Is that why you're always telling? <laughs> well, then you do a good job making sure they do what they need to do. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So here we see be completely humble, and then humility looks like Gentleness, treating people gentle, not harshly, being patient with them, giving them room to be who they are, and bearing with one another. Do you know what that word means, bearing with one another? It means carrying their burdens. That's literally what that means. And the word in the Greek, if I remember correctly, uh, means a pressing weight. So it's not like, hey, can I carry that handbag for you? It's like, hey, can I get that 30-gallon water jug out of your truck and carry it to the house for you? Uh, my buddy Adam uh, was giving away a piano, and he said, hey, can you help me move this piano? I was like, hey, I love you, man, but mm, I don't know. <laughs> but he had just helped me with something, so I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And we carried that piano out of the house, and it's heavy. Yeah, it was just the two of us. And so that attitude of carrying one another's weight, carrying one another's burdens looks like this. So you got a friend who's a little annoying. Yeah, anyone who's a friend of mine can say amen to that. <laughs> See? And so you carry that burden. It's okay. He's a little annoying. That's all right. Or how about you've got a friend that has a need? You carry that need. That's okay. It's all right. How about you have a friend who's stuck in some kind of sin? Ooh, well, pastor, I can't do that. I don't want to. I don't want to enable the behavior. Well, are you going to carry his burden or not? Get in there. Not in the sin, but you know, get in there and help him carry the burden. <laughs> I got to be careful to be clear on that one. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It looks like submitting. That word submit is hupotasso in the Greek. It means to place yourself under. Now you think, well, I I guess everyone can just step on me. No, that's not what that means, okay? It's more specific than that. It means to put yourself under them in level of importance. Start with them. That's why I say that uh, humility is thinking of other people first. Then finally, Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. Stop passing judgment on one another. Now, why do I include that one in the list with humility? Because you can't judge someone that you've placed yourself under. You have to place yourself over them in order to judge them. (laughs) Yeah, I'll tell this. I just won't use the name. It was a lady this morning that was here who's diminutive in height. And she was goofing around with some of her friends and she was trying to look down her nose at them. But they were all like a foot and a half taller than her. So she's like, you know, trying to get her nose far enough up that she can look down at them. That's what happens when you've hupotassoed, when you've submitted yourself and placed yourself under. You can't look down your nose at them because they're up there. Is that a good illustration? Come on, that was perfect. You had to be there. I'm going to get in trouble for telling that story. I know it. But when we submit ourselves to one another, when we consider other people first, when we bear their burdens, when we serve them, we can't judge them. So if we're judging them, we can't do the other things. A proud person judges, a humble person loves. Now, let me ask you a question then. What does humility look like in real life? An act of humility or a demonstration of humility, whatever. What? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were giving an answer. Okay, sorry. Hey, I asked anyone and I heard a voice. Kind of like when you ask any other announcements and someone scratches their nose, you're like, oh, yeah. You're like an auctioneer. So now everyone's scratching their nose. <laughs> what does it look like? Humility. We think. That was a little harder, isn't it? Denying yourself, yeah. But denying yourself for someone else, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Well, and he, I mean, he did all of those things. Uh, just for the recording, we're talking about Moses, who claimed to be the most humble man alive. Basically, like, wow, can you say isn't that an oxymoron? But what did he do? He served the Israelites. He submitted himself to God and even to them in the sense that he allowed them to make decisions for the group as well. Um, uh, what was, what were some of the others? Uh, he didn't judge them when they were being outright rebellious. He went to God and said, please don't destroy them. I mean, it was, yeah, he was humble. Uh, yeah. Way to just summarize it all. Don't leave anything else for anybody else. <laughs> Amen. What do you think? What does it look like to be humble? If it needs to be a negative, like, well, don't do this, that's fine. Because sometimes humility is more in what you don't do than what you do. Serving someone? Good. Yeah. Mm, Doing it without recognition or needing the recognition. Or expecting a return. Yeah, also, yeah, very good. Right, right. Well, and you know, there's nothing wrong with recognition. And there's, there's nothing wrong with a reward. It's just humility doesn't require those things. Yeah. Yes, sir. To, to the world, it looks like a weakness. Is that what you said? Yeah. It does, because, I mean, if, from the outside, it looks like um, letting people walk all over you. That's what it looks like from the outside. But the interesting thing about meekness, which is another way to translate humility, is that it is the quiet strength. There's tremendous strength in meekness and humility. Um, I was uh, chatting with some friends at my reunion, and uh, 
we were talking about back in high school, you know, because you're reminiscing, and I can't remember how the conversation went, but basically they were talking about how, um, how embarrassed you would get when something went wrong, you know, when you fell or something like that, and people, you would be so embarrassed. And I remember thinking I was like that for a long time, but then after a while I got to the point where, you know, I just don't care what you think about me. Not because I'm proud, like I'm somebody special, but just because, I, why would I? I care what God thinks about me. And he's laughing at the fact that I fell. So I might as well laugh too. And there was a quiet strength in that, in that I was not moved by other people. Does that make sense? I don't need the approval of other people. Even though I'm humble and the world looks at that and says, well, a humble person needs other people, you know, to pat them. No, no, that's not what it looks like. So yeah, yeah. Okay, it is after eight, so we need to close. We'll do the, uh, the next two probably next week. But I want to encourage you this week as you're, as you're going about your days, as you're interacting with other people, as you, you know, you bump in and you rub the wrong way and all that kind of stuff happens. Think about this. The Bible tells me to love that person. What does that look like? How does that look like in this circumstance? It calls me to be humble with one another. What does that look like in this circumstance? And I'll bet you dollars to donuts that you're going to find yourself going, Oh man, I've been doing it wrong. And that's okay. That's where grace comes in. And allow God to give you the strength to do it right. Because the better we live as Christians, the better our witness will be to the world, the more successful our lives will be as believers, and the greater God's kingdom will be. Let's close with prayer. Father, I thank you for being a God that gives us the grace and the power through the Holy Spirit to be loving and humble. I know, Father, that it is not in, our, in ourselves to do that but you've allowed that uh, through, through your power. And Father, I pray that you would be clear in our spirits and our minds, that we would uh, see opportunities to be loving and humble and, and be obedient in those so that uh, you can receive the glory. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.